Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, after deadly ISIL attacks in Paris and Beirut, what is life like in both cities? We speak with local residents about the aftermath of the attacks and what lies ahead. So we have a story here, or stories here, where there's a very thin dividing line between what's happening in traditional media and social media, so much playing out between Beirut and Paris. What do you have, Melita? Definitely a conversation that's pretty rich online. Now, there are two hashtags from two capitals in mourning, and they've spread across the world. The biggest, Pray for Paris, has more than six million mentions so far. Pray for Lebanon has nearly half a million mentions. Now, online, many people noted that discrepancy, but today we'll push past the hashtags to focus on what life is like now for residents of Paris in Beirut. Mokhtar in the French capital writes, the world has gone mad. He's not alone. In the Lebanese capital, Mohammed tweets, prayer is the best weapon we have. Now, as people across the globe continue to tweet support for both cities, we want to hear from you. Join our conversation with hashtag AJStream. Hi, I'm Elsa Ray, spokesperson of Collective Against Islamophobia in France, and I am in the stream. Between the cities of Beirut and Paris, at least 172 people have been killed and hundreds injured by last week's deadly ISIL attacks. A double suicide bombing in the southern part of the Lebanese capital Beirut and a series of coordinated shootings and explosions across the French capital Paris have shocked communities in both countries and across the world. How does a city and its people recover from these tragic events? To help us talk about this, we're joined by Eli Fares, a doctor and blogger from Beirut, Habib Bata, an investigative journalist and editor of the Beirut Report website, Samia Halrufbi is a European coordinator for the Foundation of Ethnic Understanding, and Avi Herbacek is a French citizen and Paris resident. So if we uh, rewind, Avi, to Friday evening, where were you and what do you remember about the attacks going across Paris? Yes, um, I remember I was at uh, an event organized um, by university yeah. in Paris. And we were about 100 pe 120 people in, in the room. And um, suddenly, someone next to me um, was on Twitter and um, talked about an attack. Uh, I didn't really pay attention. I couldn't, of course, couldn't have imagined uh, what happened. Uh, but just a few moments afterwards, um, one of the organizers spoke to the crowd and said that there was an attack in the 10th district of Paris uh, and that there were, there were casualties uh and and that we were going to be stuck in the building uh until at least midnight uh -huh. uh, for security reasons sure. um just at that moment everyone you know, naturally reached out to their phones their computers trying to find out what was going on uh we were all uh trying to talk see what was true what was not true what were rumors what were not rumors um and calling our family and close ones to tell them uh to ask them if they were okay of course and 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 uh, asked them to uh, stay away from the areas that were affected by the shootings. Sure. Um, that was the first response. Then we uh, things became a little bit more chaotic uh, when we realized that it was not just one attack; there were other attacks going so, on. So, Avi, but not, attacks. not everybody's been in a in a in, in a situation like this. So, when you say a little bit more chaos, what does that actually mean? What do you see around you? Uh, what I see around me is a lot of people trying to you know, calling and saying, "Wow, there was an attack in the tenth. Now there's an yeah. attack in the eleventh. Uh, trying to find out where, you know, where exactly were the attacks, so they could stay. To, they could tell their families where not to go. Um, and uh, I wasn't in an area. I was in Paris. I wasn't yeah. in an area that was affected um, directly by by the attacks. Um, but we were all. We were all shocked. Uh, we didn't know what was going to happen next. There were attacks in, in the north of Paris, in the, in the center of Paris. There were rumors about attacks that didn't happen in the end. So what's interesting is that Eli, uh, on Thursday, uh, it wasn't much of a birthday for you. This was, was a, a special day for you. I, I'm wondering, Avi, from your experience and from Eli and in Beirut, something very similar happening there. What do you want to ask him about what you experienced and what he may have experienced that might bring you two together? Right. Um, I mean, 
the first question I, I would ask would be what where, where were you were you um, what were your vision first response um, and what did you first think when you what was your what did you first think uh, when you um, when, when you had when you heard about the attacks yeah. Ili? So um, the story goes is that so I'm a doctor and I work at a hospital. I have medical students who um, that I tutor, and they were joking that um, the following day, which was Friday the 13th, would, would have been my birthday, and that it falling on a Friday would it's a, is an omen. I shrugged them off. So that that Thursday, a, a couple of friends had invited me for an early birthday dinner. I was joining them at a restaurant. We ha we sat there and. Um, uh, a friend of mine who had a source, um, who has sources basically, uh, told us what happened before the news had broke yet. So our response was immediately like, like you had, was to grab our phones, grab our laptops, where I had my phone with me, and to start um, checking the news and reading what was happening and trying to, to make sense of what was happening. See, I think my city has a reputation of being always war-torn or, or being a violent place, but the fact of the matter is we haven't had such, a, such an attack at such a high scale since uh, August 2013, when such an attack happened, not in Beirut even, what happened in Tripoli, in the north, and 47 people died. So, Ili, so were you it's shocked? Not that we are used to this. Were, were you? Were you? Yeah, yeah. I, I was shocked because I had absolutely no, no, no idea that such a thing would happen. I mean, when, once you have, once you have such long stretches of safety and of call, of political calm, at least uh, given the upheaval in the region. You get used to it, and so you take it for granted. So when, when it gets perturbed in such a way, um, it sort of destabilizes you the way it destabilizes your city. So your response would be first to to reach some sort of, uh, of sense, to try and make sense of what was happening, and then try to explain what was happening, and in typical Lebanese fashion, move on and uh, rebuild immediately. Mm. And it's that word shocked is one we're seeing over and over and over again online. This is Darim who tweets, I felt shock, sadness, disbelief, more numb than anything else really. It's not a situation one likes to get used to. And this is out of Beirut. We also got a video comment, uh, Habib, that I'm going to pass to you. Uh, this is a comment from someone named Hassan out of Beirut. And he describes how he felt. I want you to have a listen. Hello, Hassan Shabran from Beirut. The atmosphere in Beirut after the twin explosion last Thursday is quite tense and the security is tighter. But I think there is, also, there is also a sense of unity between the people to condemn these attacks and to condemn the amalgams created after the attacks. What will happen after this for Lebanon, I don't know, but I think that we'll have to break the fear ISIL is trying to impose on us. So Habib, I want to go to you with the question that Ely raised, which is how do you make sense of this? I mean, you don't. Uh, you, you can't get prepared. You can't get used to this kind of thing. People think that, you know, we get used to it. That's, that's just false. I mean, um, you feel very sad. You feel very worried about the future. People in Beirut are always trying to get a visa to leave the country. So um, it's a very cynical and depressing environment sometimes when this keeps happening. Um, and by the way, you know, Lebanon is not back to normal because, uh, you know, Lebanon has a lot of other problems right now. You know, there's uh, uh, armies fighting uh, radical ISIL type movements in the east of the, the country right now. Uh, they've been, that's been going on for a while. There's been raids, uh, uh, suspected suicide bombers in Tripoli and other cities. Um, so, and then on top of all that, we have so many other problems in Beirut. You know, garbage is piling up on the streets. Uh, there are so many refugees, millions of refugees. Uh, over a million refugees. So, I mean, people are just kind of, you know, trying to cope with one thing after another in Lebanon. Um, it's very challenging. Uh, it's, it's not easy. And, and this kind of thing, you know, just makes you more worried. I know Hassan. Um, I'm glad that he's optimistic about that. There's some, you know, there's some news that there's some kind of uh, a little bit of sense of unity. You know, the government in Lebanon is, is fractured. The parliament hasn't opened uh, for, 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 for months. Um, so this tragedy might, there's word that, you know, Hezbollah and its rivals in the pro-Western camp are increasingly kind of, there's word that they could get together to form a government, uh, uh, to open, at least make the government work again. Um, and that would be essential because we're having so many other problems in Lebanon right now. Literally the stench of garbage is everywhere. Uh, when you're driving down the highway, you smell it. Um, so, you know, Lebanon's a very dysfunctional, broken country. It has a lot of other problems to deal with. So, Samia, yeah, but Habib, you, you, um, go, go, uh, go ahead, Eli. 
despite the country being dysfunctional this much, I mean, I agree with you, it's, it's barely working, it's a semi-state at this point, but in spite of it, for the last while it has been extremely calm when it comes to security when it comes to security wise i mean we haven't had any attacks we haven't had any assassinations um the, gar the garbage crisis occurred the, the most that happened during that crisis was um some riots and a very very oppressive governmental response to that riot but apart from that i mean when i was saying that people were used to feeling safe i mean at least uh, as safe as the lebanese can feel i meant that at least for the past year or year and a half or maybe even two years we haven't had these shifts when it comes yeah. to the violence that people associate with Lebanon. Uh, I mean, the garbage crisis is still there. Let me just um, check in, Eli, 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 let, me just, let me just check in with uh, Samia here. Samia, how, do you, how safe do you feel in, in Paris right now? We don't feel safe, uh, to be honest with you. Um, we have been under attack in the beginning of this year with Charlie Hebdo and the Ipecash grocery attacks. Uh, and 11 months after, uh, we are in the same situation, and it's even worse because in terms of, of the blind violence, in terms of, of attacking very, the most vibrant, the most diverse uh, and populated uh, district of Paris, we do not feel at, at, uh, we do not feel secure and safe. I was in, I was in Paris uh, on Saturday night, and I was in Paris on, on Friday, on, on Sunday, and I've never, never felt in my entire life such tension um so much sadness in, in, in the eyes of the people and during the minutes of silence i was in place de la republique where everyone gathered and i've seen hundreds of people crying at the same time during this this minutes of silence so so it is a really sad situation where we are uh, and it's very difficult to to keep united because we know that the following days will be complicated for each one of us. Samia, I want to play you something. This yeah. the, the, a couple of people were uh, and, and Avi there as well. A couple of people, uh, many people, turned out the day after the attacks in Paris uh, to pay their respects very informally. In fact, they were you were told to stay at home. I wanted to show you what happened. Uh, just one place. <laughs> See, that is just blind terror, yeah. Abby, right, I, and Samia? Right. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I agree, there's uh, the general tension. I was there a few minutes ago. So it, there, there, was a, there was people saying, uh, shouting and, and shouting, saying that there was someone with a, with a weapon or with a Kalashnikov, and suddenly everyone started uh, running like, like crazy, and I have never seen such such seen in my in my in my city yeah. it's un unbelievable so the uh, conversation true, uh, like right now I, I, I hear you there but the conversation right now is now on then what should that response be to this because of course it's a common enemy ISIL uh, so there's a tweet here from John who says personally I'd have deployed troops of soldiers to Syria and Iraq to confront these barbarians and ensure they are defeated and we do see increased airstrikes on Raqqa there's also a tweet here from Hajar though and she says airstrikes will cause destruction but they won't kill extremist ideas France must look at why youth join terrorist groups in the first place so Avi I, I want to push that to you and I also hear Semya saying exactly Exactly. So both of you, either of you, to take that on and, and the response, and do you think it's appropriate? Right. Well, there is definitely a sense of tension in Paris, and it's obvious because there's there has been security failures and people don't feel safe. There were the attacks on Charlie Hebdo. There were also an attack, a uh, prevented attack on the Talis train a couple of months ago, people forget. It could have been a massacre, and there was these attacks. So there's, people definitely feel unsafe. Uh, but there's also, at the same time, uh, and I've seen this on Monday when people were going back to work, uh, there's also a sense of resilience. And it's also one of the ways Parisians, and I'm sure Lebanese, the Lebanese in Beirut can relate to that, that it's, it's one of the ways of saying, we are fighting back, we are resilient, we want to go back to our regular lives. Uh, you know, there were attacks, okay, we, there's fear, but we, life has to go on and life must continue. And in a way, that is an act of resist resistance. Uh, and I see, I definitely see that. I definitely see that in, in the conversations, conversations I have with my colleague at work or my friends, saying that we we can't be uh, fearful. We, there is fear. It's rational. It's a rational response. 
but also the best act of resistance is just for life to go on and 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 just move on. Do you like? But at the same time, Savia, go ahead. I, I, yeah, please. At, at the same time, I was saying that we know also too far that we're gonna be under threat. That we're gonna be once more a target. We have seen it 11 months before. Right. We're gonna see it, and and I don't believe that bombing Greca like we did the day after the terrorist attack is an appropriate answer. I don't think that bombing Syria is an answer to 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 the terrorists because the terrorists are coming from our own country. We need to think why how youth are going to Syria and coming back to kill us. This is one of the questions we have to answer. And I don't see that the French government is answering those real answers, those real questions. A any uh, connection, Habib, between the way the French government and the Lebanese government are responding? Uh, it's complicated with Lebanon because the politics situation is very complicated. But do you see any parallels at all? Yeah, I mean, I think all these tragedies create like a post 9-11 atmosphere where people want revenge. Um, and um, I was watching John Oliver, for example, the popular TV show, and mm. he was just saying the F word like 10 times. I hope I can't I play you, but it's on my Twitter feed. So take a look if you want to see yeah. it. Uh, pretty yeah. good political analysis, I would say, from that. Yeah, I don't, you know, I mean, this is just the kind of anger. There's jingoism that comes into play. People start waving flags. I know in the United States after 9-11, I mean, mm. the dissent is not tolerated. You can't criticize things. And that happens in Beirut, too. You know, right after the bombing, there was flag waving, Hezbollah flags. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a bit different uh, because it's, a, it's, it's, you know, it's a much more intimate um, battle. Uh, but I, I think that, um, you know, it is, it is kind of worrying, I think, when people get really into this mindset of we've got to kill the enemy, we've got to kill the enemy, yeah. and we're not really thinking seriously about the underlying causes. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, the idea that everything is okay, um, it, it's okay for people living in a bubble, which is the middle class and, and the wealthy, and the same thing in Paris and any city <laughs> in the world. Um, you know, wherever you live and wherever you're watching today, there's probably some neighborhood an hour or less away from you where violence is happening uh, very regularly. And the media doesn't care about it. So it's not just Beirut that gets left out. You know, even Beirut gets left out within Beirut. Mm. Um, so, so people are living, you know, privileged lives. But then there is a huge amount of people that are really suffering constantly. And now with the media, people are able to kind of show off, you know, with Instagram, how well they're living. And I think, you know, there's a lot of resentment in the world today between this big divide between kind of like, you know, the new aristocracy, which is us that are connected and, and and have privilege and go have education with people that don't have jobs and don't live. And every day they live miserable lives in Lebanon or other places where there's bombs going off in parts of Lebanon, you know, very far from the capital where nobody's talking about, even in Lebanon. Um, so I think that we have to be careful with this idea that everything is okay. Um, it's okay for some people. Um, and I think the more that we can really under try to understand um, and look to people that are suffering and try to see where they're coming from, um, the better, you know, the, the less we'll kind of uh, I'll create this atmosphere that people can exploit. Well, um, Habib, I actually want to push that concept yep. so, over to um, Ely. I want to push that to Ely with this tweet, though, because uh, that idea about violence might be happening an hour away from you. This is Dina who tweets in, the attack on Beirut is going to deepen the sectarian divide there. The attack on Paris is going to draw in the West to fight in Syria to portray it as a war on Islam. So I want you to focus on her, her first line of that tweet, the attack on Beirut deepening divides. Do you think that that's already happening? Um, acutely, the attack on Beirut has not actually deepened the divide in Lebanon. I mean, previous attacks have had a more sectarian feel to them, at least when it comes to people's response. This time around, as Habib said at the beginning, there was a sense of unity, at least in the country, towards these attacks. People were tired from politicizing everything, from making everything sectarian, at least when it comes to this particular attack. You know, once once you're, the pre in the previous times when the when the when Lebanon politically was was much 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 more divided than now, uh, but it's still divided. But at least when it comes to present Lebanon now, people are tired of dehumanizing their own fellow citizens simply by uh, putting a political hyphen next to their victimization. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the international response uh, towards the attacks in Paris, I think it shows how people just don't learn. I mean, post 9-11, the US intervened in Afghanistan and then Iraq and uh, destabilized the entire Middle East to cause what is happening today with ISIS and the, these radical Islamic groups. and. I think I think the problem at hand is when you have these terrorists that are emerging from your own country. You just do, the the thing that makes sense is not to go bomb where these terrorists are training, but to solve the problem in your own country. Mm. 
the problem with France is that they've had these uh, policies that have progressively led to the marginalization of a lot of minority groups in their own country that have led some people who are maybe gullible or, pe or people who are not critical enough to fall for the messages of ISIL. And in such circumstances, when ISIL is using, ISIL will use such attacks and tell any Muslim or any mind that is sensitive to its message, look at these French, they're attacking you in your own land, they're launching a war against Islam, or they're making sure that you are unsafe in your own country, or that they will make sure that these policies are not okay, and that they will refuse the refugees who are exactly like you from entering their own land. Really? This whole combination of things, this constellation of, of ideologies will affect people who are susceptible into even becoming more, more radicalized. The solution is not to bomb, it's to see why ISIL is there to begin with and to try and fix uh -huh. it by mm. embracing I people, not just... Uh, I, guess, with guess I, I guess I really, I really want to show you this because I, I think that um, it, it, it was a very poignant piece of video, Avi, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask you off the back of this, your response. So this is a, a clip from Le Petit, Petit Journal. It's a, a father and son, and you'll see how young the little boy is um, and how intuitive he is as well. Have a look at this. Do you understand why these people have done Oui, parce qu'ils sont très 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 méchants. Les méchants, c'est pas très gentil les méchants. Et il faut faire vraiment attention parce qu'il faut il faut changer de maison. Mais non, t'inquiète pas. On n'a pas besoin de changer de maison. C'est la France notre maison. Mais il y a des méchants, papa. Oui, mais il y a des méchants partout. Ils ont les pistolets, ils peuvent nous tirer dessus parce qu'ils sont très très méchants. C'est pas grave, ils ont des pistolets, nous on a des fleurs. Bah les fleurs ça fait rien, c'est pour, c'est pour, c'est pour. Euh... Si regarde, tu vois tout le monde pose des fleurs. Oui. C'est pour combattre les pistolets. C'est pour, c'est pour protéger. Voilà. So. Avi, uh, you were on our program after the Charlie Hebdo attacks. You're on our program again after the most recent attacks in Paris. What's changed for France? Right. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, differences between the attacks, uh, on the aftermath, uh, the attacks on Charlie Hebdo and the attacks here. Uh, and the response was also different. Um, so in terms of public debate and the ideas that I've that I've been hearing. Um, the attacks on Charlie Hebdo were tar targeted a symbol. They targeted freedom of expression. Yeah. The attacks uh, that happened last week, uh, Friday, um, a lot of people were saying they just wanted to kill as many people as possible. Uh -huh. Others are saying they were the symbol. We're not really sure what the symbol was. Maybe Which, the symbol what's, was what's generation. What's, what's the difference between France on Friday and France today? Um, there's a lot of frustration, and I understand that there's a debate on what what what, could, what can we do? What can we do to yeah. protect friends? What can we do to uh, what can we do to make sure that these happen right. these I, attacks won't happen again? I, I, Some I, are saying they should. Yeah. I I I want to ask the same thing to Habib. Actually, what's what's the difference between last Thursday and today for Lebanon? Anything? You know, um, people feel a little bit helpless. I mean, they don't really know what to do. As I said, they're facing so many problems. They're, they're facing this refugee crisis, garbage crisis, crisis, constitutional crisis. No government is not open. So what's changed? I is mean, it it's, feeling it's really more hard helpless? To, people feel I helpless, think some people, really you know, it depends, again, where yeah. you live. If, if yeah. you lost people, if you lost friends, sure. you're going to have a lot bigger impact. If you live in that neighborhood, then you're going to have that impact. If you don't live in that neighborhood, um, it's it's like you know a mass shooting okay. goes so on in American Abhi city somewhere. And Samya and Avi and Ili, yeah. two great cities. Right. Really hard to fit them into one show. We're taking your conversation to our post show, but before we do that, Malika, I'll end with this tweet from Andy, who says the sadness is utterly heartbreaking. What am I going to tell my children? She goes on to say, what we need after Beirut and Paris is peace, not fear, not violence, not surveillance, not war. We take a look at my laptop here. This is the Al Jazeera program, The Listening Post, coming up this Saturday over the weekend at 800 GMT. We'll also be talking about Beirut and Paris, mainstream and social media media, and the discrepancy between the two. Thanks for watching.
Good to have you back again. So much to talk about. We're trying to talk about Beirut and Paris. And it's really difficult. We're very ambitious in this program. I want to get back to Avi, because Avi, you were trying to kind of unpack the fallout from this attack. There have been other attempts, actually, in France. Right. But this one, I don't even want to say successful, but this one, this one was mayhem, OK? Um, what's the fallout from your point of view? Right. Um, the, 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 the responses are different, and a lot of people feel powerless is what to do. And um, some are saying that there should be reforms, uh, security reforms. Uh, obviously, it takes time. Um, other people are drawing a parallel between the, France's participation in the coalition against ISIS and seeing this as a retaliation. Some are saying we should stop bombing so that because other, otherwise we'll always be targets. Yeah. Uh, some some others are saying that, and I I I understand the argument that uh, there are countries that are not participating in a coalition that are that were victims of of radicalism. So whether you're participating or not it doesn't really make a difference because the target is a way of life. The target is something else that's different that's different than participating or not in the coalition. Mm -hmm. Um, there has there has been these debates, and they they reflect the fact that people are powerless and don't know what to do, and and they it's it, you know, they rely on their government to, to make these deci these decisions. Um, do you we're feel also that in the in context good, of, of national hands? election of regional uh, elections. Yeah, sure. Do you feel that you're in good hands then, because um, your president and the French government have been they've done a lot since Friday. I know. A lot. I mean, they've been busy. Right. Yeah, they have. I think they have. Been, have... Uh, yeah. They are doing, I'm sorry, can I jump in? I'm sorry, but they, they are doing course, the same ahead, thing yeah. that they did for decades. They are not answering the right question. We are not pondering over our foreign policy. We are going straight to, to wars. I, I, I agree with the last tweet. We, I don't think that we're going to bring about change by feeding wars. I don't think that this is a clash between civilization. I don't think that this is a clash between Islam and the West. I think this is a clash within civilization between people who are feed and greed for wars and those who want broken into their heart to, to bring about change and bring peace in our country. It is a global issue, and we have to address this globally. We have seen that Paris, Tunis, uh, Beirut are the targets of those radical terrorists. And, and we, I don't think that weapons are the, are the solution. Uh, Mika, where do you want to take us Can next? I well, it's actually picking up on the point that Samir raised that you don't feel any safer. This is uh, someone who tweeted in, I'd rather be concerned that despite international cooperation, services still fail to prevent the threat. And this tweet was specifically uh, regarding Paris. But I, I wonder, you in Beirut, Habib, if you're feeling the same thing, if you're feeling like uh, your government should do more, is not doing enough, or is doing all that they can. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with this idea that, uh, you know, we're not going to bomb our way to peace. Um, it's never worked. Uh, the whole Middle East has been bombed so many times and so many forceful coup d'etats by especially Western governments, colonial powers. None of that has helped at all. It's made things a lot worse. I think we should look and ask questions about the higher people up in the power structure. The weapons industry is doing very well right now. There was just a a graphic that went viral on, uh, on Twitter about how much arms sales are, are, are benefiting from the attacks on Paris. So let's have a harder look at who, who makes our policies, who takes us to war. Exactly. You know, what are the, what are the corporations and the that they there's hire also something that, that us to these conflicts? So there's something to say about the fact that, um, yeah, France is bombing uh, Syria or as, at least ISIS at a, at a certain location, but they're perpetuating policies that are enabling the countries actually weaponizing ISIS at the, at the same time. It's sort of like a, a catch-22. So you, you bomb ISIS at one hand, and then you enable the countries giving ISIS weapons at another hand by, by at least supporting them, by making sure that their human rights violations go through, by making sure that they get to do whatever they can without repercussions, such as Saudi Arabia or Qatar. There they are the, one, they are the main funders of ISIS. They're the countries that are funding ISIS anyway whatsoever, and yet they run free with it. And then ISIS comes back to bite France. I mean, you, you can't let the cycle go around without without cutting it somewhere. And 
bombing uh, bombing Syria or bombing ISIS, which is France, which is what France is doing now, is sort of putting fuel on the fire again, and it's not the solution. It's sort of like the macho response that any anyone would expect from a country that's been hurt this way. But it's not the mature response. It's not the politically correct response, and it's not the response that can actually fix what's happening here. When it comes to my country, Lebanon, I think the government is essentially powerless. As we said before, our government cannot govern uh, the entire country. We can we have a garbage crisis. There are certain areas of my country which are essentially without governance, without uh, without infrastructure. Um, I don't think the government can do anything, which is which is why people maybe a bit manifested by people panicking about the Facebook safety button because that's how they felt worthy, or that's how they felt that they mattered. But the fact of the matter is, I have no idea what the Lebanese government can do except issue statements and condone what happened. Because, I mean, if, if history has taught us anything, it's that our government can do investigations, but its, its investigations will rarely to lead to any results. And uh, we just have to wait, wait, basically wait it out until the next attack happens. Mm. Um, Avi, how long after the Charlie Hebdo attacks did you feel comfortable about being out and about in Paris again? How long did that take? Um, it took about a couple of days again. Um, I wanted, I knew that there was a risk that there were going to be more attacks, but, um, I wanted to go out. I wanted to life to go back to normal. Um, I feel less safe now, uh, to be honest, in terms of, I think the security threat now is higher than it was, uh, Charlie Hebdo. Yeah. There's something here I, I, I want to share with you. We, we talk, we're bouncing back and forth about what's happening on and off social media. I want to show you this. It's a Tu Bistro, which is a uh, hashtag that's being shared on Twitter right now, which is basically, let's all hang out at the bar. And people are actually tweeting defiantly pictures of themselves outside in Paris, enjoying the cafe night, getting out and about, just we on Taras. Um, and right. all, of these, all of these pictures here, uh, have you got that spirit, Avi, or are you... Uh, yeah, that, that's what I was talking to. That, that, yeah, that was, that's what I was trying to refer to earlier, that they see it as an act of resistance, going out, they're tweeting about it, they, there's hash, different hashtags, uh, and I see, that, I see that on my news feed, on Facebook and Twitter. A lot of people are saying, you know, this is, this is our way of showing, of, of showing that we're resilient. And there's definitely, I definitely see that spirit, the spirit of resilience. Um, yeah. It's also the same for people in Brussels. This is a tweet we got from Marco where some of the manhunt and the investigations are going on. Marco says, the only way to get past this is by people not changing their lifestyle. If people stayed home for fear or if governments changed their agenda, he writes, then terrorism wins. But Liam here in Paris writes, I don't know what I expect to happen next. We must go on with our lives, but the indiscriminate nature of the attack impedes that. So, Semi, I'm wondering if you feel similarly. Do you feel nervous about being in crowds, about being out? I mean, allow me to bring, uh, to bring an anecdote, a uh, conversation that, that I had with a, with a friend of mine just after the terrorist attack. She's veiled, uh, she lives in suburbs, and she's black. And after the, the attack, she couldn't go out. First, because she was devastated, and secondly, because she was fearing people to blame her, to despise her, and to look uh, with anger at her. And this is what happened. I saw it today in, in, in Place de la République, in the city center of Paris. I saw people going to a Muslim veiled woman, asking her for, 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 for answer and questioning her about her belonging to this country. So probably Tuso Bistro is a nice hashtag but I would rather see nous sommes unis, we are together and we are united. Because, because this is the right answer to give to terrorists, right. but also to give to those people who want to divide us. Mm. It's true. And there, there were, um, there were uh, movements of solidarity uh, after the Charlie Hebdo attack, and we're not seeing this now. I don't know it's, if it's because of the political context, because we're in the context of regional elections in France, there's going to be regional elections in two weeks. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what the reason is, maybe because maybe they would have been, um, people would have gathered in the street and, and a show of solidarity if we were allowed to. We're not allowed to by law now uh, because there is a state of emergency. But it's true that it happened after Shadi Abdul and it hasn't happened uh, now after the attacks. Yeah. And that is, I, I think that's, I'm a bit worried. I'm a bit worried that there'll be a, a backlash against 
Muslim communities, I'm worried that um, some communities may be singled out uh, and that... Uh, which is what ISIS wants at the end of the day. Which, which is what ISIS which is what ISIS, ISIS, ISIS comes to this. It's causing the destabilization, causing increased in Islamoph Islamophobic tendencies in Europe and in France maybe in particular. So it can get those who are susceptible to hear its message and rise up. It's also, maybe their goal is also to cause a, a, sh a shift or a rise in the refugee crisis in Europe by, by, by pointing those refugees as, a, as all being potential terrorists and potential destabilizers of, of this European identity um, that Western civilization seems to love this much. But the fact of the matter is, as I said in, in a blog post of mine, um, November 13th in Paris has been the night of these refugees for the past two or three years. And uh, they're escaping the same people that attacked you in, in Paris. So, uh, yeah. Can I just... Yeah. And, yeah. Who yeah. wanted to just I mean, I go that's... ahead and just do it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's very worrying, the language that we're hearing in the US, for example, the governors that are rejecting Syrians. Now this idea that uh, you have to be a Christian Syrian to come to America, as one official said. Um, and it was good that the president of the U.S. tried to clarify that. But it's very worrying. I think there's a very worrying, uh, deep-seated tendency below all this. And I think a, a bit of that fuels this kind of jingoistic flag waving. Is that you know uh, we're you know we we are kind of taking a stance. Uh, we are um, you know we, we are not going to take this anymore from these people. Um, so I think we have to be very careful with that. And it, to me, that's worrying. I mean, just like it's worrying that there are these radicals out there, it's also worrying to me that there's all this kind of silent, deep-seated anger out there that's kind of popping up. But I, I, I know that I don't want to sound too pessimistic. And I, I know you asked me what people, people could do. I think what people can do is be compassionate. I mean, be compassionate for others. Try to treat others the way you want to be treated. There's a great thing called the Charter of Compassion by an academic called Karen Armstrong. She did a great TED Talk on that. I think we have to care about people all around the world and other places to kind of break to try to chip away this kind of big divide that we have today between the aristocrats, those who have uh, money and power, um, or even just the middle class and the rest of the world that's really suffering. And I think I draw a little bit of hope from the fact that the media got told uh, you know, this, that, that people do matter in other places and the media reacted because the Habib, bloggers, you, you know, are the media. Are... <laughs> You're part of the media. <laughs> yeah, told yourself. Media, that, that doesn't mean, well, I'm trying to do what, my part, All um, right. I think, but you know, but there, there's, you know, People are having an impact. I think social media power is being decentralized mm -hmm. slowly and slowly. People can kind of take back their government, and it's happening in Lebanon too. There's a great activism movement that's happening mm -hmm. in Lebanon. Um, you. It's you know, it's despite all odds, people are trying to do something. There's a lot of problems with it, but I think people do have kind of hope and, and can kind of take some power back all from right. this kind of militant ideology that we have in politics. I wish I had I mean, you under people much. People having hope is what drives them forward sure. when it comes to. Go, going to the bistro in Paris, or, or even even the the Talat Hatkom movement in Lebanon, which is the the movement against government against trying to fix the garbage crisis, people always having hope is what drives them forward. That's that's the key to everything. But then again, um, has it worked? All right. So Ili and Habib and Samia and Avi, I wish I had you under better circumstances because I've really enjoyed the depth and unpacking that you've done from us about Beirut, about Paris, and about these deadly attacks. I really appreciate the time you spent with us today on the stream. One more place to visit, that's Malika and the community. Mm -hmm. I'll end with this tweet that actually was raised a little bit earlier by both Habib and Ili, and it's a, a topic that we're going to segue into for the stream later this week on Thursday. And this is a question we asked our community, what concerns do you have after these attacks? Mohammed says his main concern is linking world refugee crisis as reasons behind the spate of terrorism rather than as a vital tool for integrative peace and for compassion, as Habib says. So look forward to that conversation and we'd like your tweets on that with hashtag AJStream. We've covered actually several um, stream shows. We did the You Stink show, which was uh, about Beirut. We did the Charlie Hebdo show. We've done this show. Mm -hmm. And also one more show to mention. Have a look here on my laptop. This is the Listening Post. Our colleagues at the Listening Post on Al Jazeera this weekend at starting at 800 GMT, we'll be looking at social media, mainstream media, and how they have been covering Beirut and the Paris attacks. I know you'll be watching. Thank you everybody for taking part in this program. Take care.